All right, guys, we're covering the sample test, psych, soc, passage two. Let's get into it. All right, so this one looks really short. Um, as always, we're gonna go through the passage. I'm gonna flow chart it, show you guys what I'm paying attention to, and you can compare with what you were paying attention to. Born to a poor family in the rural southeastern United States, Alice walked five miles of dirt road every day to attend a one-room school as a child. This sounds like my dad, um, except it was uphill in the snow and he didn't have any shoes. Alice would eventually become the CEO of a large corporation, earning over a million dollars in income each year. Raised in a working-class family in an urban Midwestern city, Bill grew up with little knowledge of higher education. With similar success as Alice, Bill became the president of a major private university. Okay, so basically the AAMC is just trying to make us feel bad about ourselves. So they're giving us like two um, kind of unrelated like sort of stories about Alice and Bill. So Alice came from like dirt poor and then Bill came from like kind of just regular, um, you know, middle class kind of vibes, what I'm getting, uh, middle to lower class. And then both of them became really successful. Great. Cool. Um, the stories of Alice and Bill are recounted in a study of exceptional pathways to success. The research design utilized a snowball sampling method selection method in which new participants were enrolled in the study using the contacts of existing participants. The investigators placed their sample of a hundred subjects in one of two groups, which they labeled the path makers and the followers. So typically how I like to flow chart psych soc sections is that I like to really kind of get into the nitty gritty of the experimental methods. That's where a lot of questions are going to come from. Um, this is the psych is where they uh, test like research methods and that kind of thing. So first off, I thought it was interesting in this paragraph where they told us what this snowball sampling selection method was. Um, it was just kind of weird. Um, if you're familiar with our uh, foreshadowing strategy, then that's kind of what it's given me. Like, I don't know why they're asking that. They might ask a question on it later. Um, so it says the investigators placed their sample of 100 subjects. So I have 100 subjects um, into one of two groups. And so they either were the path makers or the followers. I don't know why FS means followers to me. Um, the followers originated from favorable socioeconomic backgrounds, while the pathmakers came from upbringing similar to those of Alice and Bill. So pathmakers, I'm going to put one dollar sign, and then the followers, I'll put three. That just tells me their socioeconomic status growing up. Both groups had relatively equivalent success later in life. So both of them were successful later in life. Um, research findings were derived from an in-depth interviews, which were subsequently coded to enable detailed analyses. Okay. Interview process. Locus of control that here this is very important. Locus of control was a central variable in the study. So that's what they're looking at. Um, the researchers hypothesized that the path makers, uh, would have stronger internal locus of control. So I'm going to put you know, I-L-O-C, uh, while the followers would have stronger external locus of control. And notice that I'm, I'm like, I'm not writing that it is the hypothesis. I'm, I'm just writing it out in my flow chart, but I have it in my head that it's the hypothesis, not necessarily the results yet. We don't know the results yet. Results supported this hypothesis. Okay, so now we know the results um, and it is supported. Um, indicating a statistically significant difference in locus of control between the pathmakers and followers. In addition to this finding, there was evidence that the pathmakers were both more self-conscious about their emotional well-being and more altruistic than the followers. Okay, so they are um, more, you know, self-conscious about their emotional well-being. So I'm going to say emote, well-being, and altruism. So... There's my flowchart, guys. Um, you know, this was a really short passage. 
I just wanted to get the experimental design down, get the variables down, that kind of thing. All right, the first question says, uh, what concept is least applicable to the stories of Alice and Bill? So Alice and Bill were, you know, Pathmaker vibes. They were like low SES, um, you know. So which one of these concepts is going to be least applicable? The way that I like to do these questions so that I don't get confused is I go through and find concepts that are applicable to Alice and Bill and then mark them off. It doesn't really matter. Um, just make sure that you're not missing questions that are like, which of the following is not supported, blah, 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 blah. Just make sure that you're like paying attention to the fact that they're asking for the one that isn't applicable. Or in this case, that is least applicable. Um, a says meritocracy. So I think that Alice and Bill are a great, um, you know, example of meritocracy. Like they worked really hard and, and they kind of got what they worked for. That's meritocracy. So I think that that is applicable. So I'm going to mark it out. B, intergenerational mobility. So that, again, like they're a great example of that. So intergenerational means that between two generations, like a mother and, and daughter or father, son, whatever, um, that there was a change in class, essentially. Um, and so definitely if Alice was born poor and she grew up to be rich, you know, she had some sort of uh, SES mobility. So that one's not right. C says social reproduction. So, so there's not really anything that has to do with social reproduction in the story of Alice and Bill or, or really in this entire passage. And so I think that that one's probably not very applicable. Uh, D says relative poverty. And uh, definitely, um, you know, both of them were probably considered relatively poor. Um, you know, Bill, like kind of, I guess, depending on what you're comparing him to, but I think Alice was definitely considered to be relatively poor. So that one's not right. So the answer here is C and I'm going to highlight it. Second question says, which statement identifies a potential weakness of the study's research design? Again, psych is where you're going to get your research questions. So, um, which one of these is going to be a weakness of what they did in the passage? A says the researchers did not assess demographic variables such as age or gender. Uh, so they didn't, like as far as I know, um, do that. So I'm going to say maybe because, you know, like it can be a weakness and it, it can also like not be. If they're not looking at any differences between the demographics, then, then why would they need to kind of include them as a variable? Uh, you know, it just makes the analyses more complicated, but... I can, I can get on it. I can get on this answer choice if nothing else looks good. B, the subjects are linked through social networks leading to sampling bias. Okay, there's where our little thing came in. Because remember I said it was weird in the passage that it talked about the snowball sampling selection in which participants were enrolled using the content, uh, the contacts of existing participants. So yeah, I can see how that would like create some bias. Like, you know, maybe all of them kind of hang in a similar group and so they have similar personalities and then that introduces confounding variables. So I'm thinking, yeah, also maybe, and I actually like it better than A, and so I'm going to mark out A. C, in-depth interviews are time-consuming, which results in researcher fatigue. Ain't nobody give an F about the researchers, and they never have and they never will. Um, so, nah. For, and in-depth interviews don't have to be time-consuming. They'll go get some, you know, undergrad to run through that like I did for like three years. Um, D says a small sample does not allow for quantifiable data, which limits uh, data analysis. So first off, they quote, they uh, coded the interviews. And so they do have some sort of like quantitative quantifiable data or whatever. Um, also, their subject size was 100 subjects. And I say this all the time, like psych social is not going to be mad at 100 subjects pretty much ever unless they're trying to like have some sort of like countrywide externally valid like they'll have studies that have like eight people in them because they're studying something really niche so I don't think that the uh, sample size is a downfall of this at all so B is going to be the right answer Sample size can be, um, you know, something that is a weakness of a study but in this case we had another weakness that was a lot stronger that, that's funny. Another weakness that was kind of 
It was a lot stronger. Anyway, another weakness that was a lot more prevalent, uh, which was B. So that's the right answer. The main purpose for including the followers in the study is, all right, so why do we put the followers in there? First off, just like thinking about it in my head, I'm like, because we were trying to see if they had an external locus of control. Like, like they were a group in the study. We were just trying to, whatever. Anyway, let's see if that's an answer choice. A, to provide an additional set of variables for the researchers to analyze. Um, so, you know, okay. I guess that's kind of what I was saying. Like, they're just, it's one of the groups that they're looking at. I'll put maybe. Um, B, to allow the researchers to increase the study sample size. I mean, they could have found plenty of folks that were broke when they grew up and ended up successful. And they would have had like 500 path makers. It doesn't explain why they wanted the followers specifically. So, nah. C, to allow comparisons for testing hypothesis related to past to success. Yeah, comparisons. That's the key word here. We're comparing the path makers to the followers and seeing the difference in their locus of control. So um, I wouldn't I wouldn't call them like a, a control group. I would just call them like a different group that we're testing, like a different test group. So um, I like C, I'll put maybe. D, to provide a different operational definition of the dependent variable. So what was the dependent variable is locus of control. So adding the followers in does not change the way that we are defining locus of control. Um, so that's not the right answer either. So between um, A and C, C is a better answer. A just doesn't really, it, it like kind of gets me there. And then like C is just like actually saying what I mean. And, you know, A is just trying to confuse you. D, uh, sorry. Next question. Based on the hypothesis stated in the last paragraph of the passage, which comment is likely to be attributed to a subject like Alice. Okay, so what was the hypothesis stated in the last paragraph? Oh, look, it's on my flowchart. It was that the pathmakers were going to have an internal locus of control and all this stuff, and the followers were going to have an external locus of control. So now um, a subject like Alice, that would be a pathmaker. So this question is essentially asking, uh, which comment is an internal locus of control comment? All right, so now that's, a, you see how I'm simplifying the question stem down to something that's a lot easier. I'm taking it out of the passage. I'm not talking about Alice. I'm not talking about pathmakers. I'm talking about internal locus of control. That's a basic science, and we should know kind of the language that surrounds people that have an internal locus of control. A, I worked very hard because I came from a poor family. So this is you know, what is an internal locus of control, first off? It is when you kind of feel like the outcomes in your life are dependent on what you do. Um, external locus of control is that the outcomes in your life are dependent on other people. So in this case, here's the outcome. You know, you working very hard. Why? Because you came from a poor family. That's an external kind of thing. You didn't control that you came from a poor family. Um, so that's not something with that an internal locus of control person would say. That's not what Alice would say. B, I did well in school because I had excellent teachers. So this one's a little bit easier to see. You, the outcome is you doing well in school. And it's not because of what you did. It's because you had excellent teachers. That's external. C, I got my first job because I was very lucky. So the outcome is that you got your first job. And I was very lucky. Y'all are like, Oh, that's me. I'm very lucky. But no, I mean, luck, that has nothing to do with you. That's like the universe or whatever you want to call it. So that's external as well. Kind of uh, dressed up as an internal locus of control thing. D, I am successful because I am a responsible person. All right. We got an outcome that, that you're successful. And why? Because you yourself in your own body are a responsible person. That's going to be our right answer here. All right, so that was a quick run through of the Psych Soch Passage 2. It was short, sweet, and simple. If you got any questions about it or, um, you know, have any materials that you want us to run through, as always, comment down below, like, subscribe, get free MCAT prep. See you next time.